just uh, reminding you yeah started hello everyone yes hello everyone welcome to the eighth biolog session i'm sundatta karik and i welcome you all on behalf of csir center for cellular and molecular biology ccmb ccmb biolog is a is an initiative primarily driven by our phd students as a part of this initiative we get to talk to different experts working in life sciences from india as well as beyond in this in these in this initiative in these series of talks we get to discuss different aspects of life sciences uh, ranging from cell biology and molecular biology to more physical or even science communication related to life sciences and in that thread today we have a very very exciting talk which um, is at probably the, at the interface of biology and physics and though i would have loved to introduce the speaker i'll pass on the mic to mihir trivedi um, one of our phd students at lacon ccmb to introduce the speaker mihir thank you somdatta thank you somdatta so today's speaker is special as in his own words he speaks about organismal biology rather than suborganismal biology about which our most previous talks have been encouraged by robert may's work on applying mathematical models on stability and diversity of ecosystems dr gupta after his msc in physics in iit kanpur went to attain his doctorate from ohio state university in applications of non equilibrium statistical physics to ecological systems after this he joined princeton university as post doctoral fellow and further established the theoretical ecology and evolution lab or the t lab in indian institute of science bangalore since then his lab has been working on understanding how various ecological and evolutionary phenomena associated with congregation of individual organisms can be modeled via equations of statistical physics so we welcome you dr vishwesh kuttal the screen is yours uh, hello everyone hello uh, it's uh, my great pleasure and honor uh, to be giving talk in this series and uh, thank you so much somdatta and mehir for very generous and kind introductions and uh, uh, and i hope that uh, uh, my talk as um, he said is a bit different because i am focusing on the organism biology and even more so because uh, i'm trying to speak from a physics the perspective of physics so uh, let me share my screen and begin my talk uh maybe if you can confirm that my screen is uh, clearly visible i can move forward it's good yeah, we it can see good. it yeah. okay. but Sorry, it's but not on screen yet it's not full screen okay. yeah slide show is not there okay let me try it again i have one shared is it full screen now mm, no slide show is not on okay okay one second how about now good now yeah yeah now oh, okay okay good uh so uh so i'm going to talk about how uh, ecology can be used viewed as uh, physics of collectives uh, in this today's talk and uh, this is a sort of a talk that i have not quite given elsewhere and it was motivated by the invitation email i received from uh, ccmb which read and if you can share us with the story of your journey through understanding ecology and evolution uh, using uh, you know theoretical physics as the sort of you know base right so uh, so i actually took this email very very seriously and then i thought you know uh, maybe i should actually uh, make this connection which uh, uh, on why i think this connection is very interesting between physics and uh, ecology and evolution uh, you know uh, somewhat very interesting and let me say that you know it is not just that i am applying theoretical physics to ecology and evolution i think there is actually a very interesting and rich parallel which i would like to see if i can convince you all about okay so uh, when i when i introduce myself to many people as a physicist in ecology it sort of confuses a lot of people and uh, it probably happens for a number of reasons i suppose uh, first is that you know uh, generally uh, there is uh, Uh, it's not very widely known what constitutes ecology for some uh, ecology might be natural history for some it might be classification of organism for someone else it might be solving problems of environmental pollution 
Okay, uh, but as we know today, ecology uh, is uh, viewed as a subject of biology where we study uh, interactions between organisms and interactions uh, uh, with the environment that these organisms live in. And how do these interactions shape uh, various levels of uh, ecological organizations? And, uh, and second confusion arises from the fact that, we, okay, that first confusion was about ecology itself. Second was that, uh, you know, physicists must be really studying, uh, you know, particles, materials, stars and galaxies, whereas ecologists do go to field and they do lab experiments. So what is it that me being a physicist and also to a theoretical physics, uh, physicist doing in ecology, right? And not only that, you know, of course, there are many, many physicists who do become ecologists. Uh, because they really like going to field. I'm a bit unusual in the sense that I continue the sort of weapons of physicists, which is which is that of pen, paper, equations, and pen, you know computers, and I sort of have I use them in ecological context. So this is probably a second cause of confusion. And thirdly, but uh, not, uh, uh, not not nothing uh, you know also equally significantly important, even for those uh, who are familiar uh, with these issues, sometimes fail to distinguish. Uh, mathematical models in ecology and broadly in biology versus statistical models. This causes a third type of confusion when I say I'm a physicist, physicist in ecology. So now I'm going to sort of try to explain these points in more detail uh, using my own research as an example. Here you're seeing uh, uh, eco you know, uh, example of uh, beautiful animals and landscapes uh, where in ecology, you know, we study uh, these uh, organisms and the ecosystems uh, uh, through the lens of interactions. You know, uh, we are seeing a you know, single male black bug. How does it maintain territoriality? Why does it maintain territoriality? And here in the middle, you see a female herd of black buck and they're foraging and they visit legs. Uh, and you know, how do they uh, move in groups? How do they arrive at decisions in groups? And why do they live in groups at all? And finally, these individuals and uh, groups and populations of many, many species together form ecosystems. Uh, and on the rightmost side, you see a landscape level picture of a, a semi-arid uh, grassland where these animals live in this uh, specific example. And in ecology, we try to understand uh, across these levels of organizations from individuals to groups to populations and ecosystems. And, and these with the lens of interacting systems. So how does this parallel to ecology physics, right? That was my main point. Uh, so let me sort of uh, break it down into many different points. First, being that you know, in both ecology and physics, we of course study individual organisms, right? In ecology, we study individual organisms. In physics, we study elementary particles and their properties. Okay. Uh, so in that sense, of course, there is this focus on understanding elementary units. Uh, it could be in the in the case of physics, uh, it could be elementary units of the physical world. Uh, in the case of uh, ecology or more broadly biology, we want to understand the elementary units of life. And uh, secondly, of course, neither physicists nor ecologists stop at individual elements. We want to understand interactions. You know, what are the interactions between organisms and what are the interactions with the environment that these organisms live? And likewise in physics, uh, physicists don't stop at describing electrons and protons, they actually describe uh, uh, the interactions between these particles. Therefore, interactions, uh, understanding interactions is in fact one of the most fundamental tenets of physics. So we don't just say electron has this charge and proton has this mass, right? We also say what happens if you put two protons or two, pro uh, you know, uh, two electrons at some distance? What happens? What, how do they interact? So, so interactions are very fundamental to both ecology and physics. And, and thirdly, there is a remarkable focus on the collective behavior of these interacting units. So if you take these animals, plants, and, and they are all, of course, living together in, uh, in a complex biological world, and these are interacting units, right? So what is the collective behavior of these interacting units? So understanding interactions by themselves, uh, uh, you know, is insufficient. We want to understand the consequences of these interactions. What is the collective behavior in terms, it could be in the form of group behavior, populations, ecosystems, or even biomes. Likewise, in, in physics, uh, physicists want to study, you know, put these materials having these, uh, you know, 
uh, we know elementary particles and their constituents and you know what are the different materials that form and what are the properties of this material right you know this could be a superconductor this could be a, a regular conductor insulated this could even be a planet or stars or a galaxy all of them constitute uh, or basically constitute a large number of interacting units right so for example solar system is a collection of a uh, large number of planets and a galaxy is a collection of large number of stars so given that we understand stars can we understand galaxies likewise uh, in ecology we try to understand given that we understand individuals can we understand populations given that we understand populations can we understand communities ecosystems right so there is this remarkable emphasis on what happens to the collection of these interacting units in both physics and ecology and uh, uh, this is a cartoon picture uh, that tries to make this point in a in a, in a very specific and a very but, but, but a context which is really really uh, of interest to me on the left hand side of this cartoon what you are seeing is basically a magnet uh, the red horizontal bar is the magnet and the the arrows they represent what we call magnetic spins when all the magnetic spins are aligned and point to the same direction we have a magnet the material will have a magnetic property right on the other hand if these spins are all pointing in different directions uh, that material will not show any magnetic properties so one question in physics is what makes magnets why you know under what conditions do these electronic spins align with each other and form magnets under what conditions they don't and how does this transition between different types of uh, you know properties of matter happen so uh, basically magnets are basically collection of collections of these interacting electronic spins likewise we can think of flocks of birds or you know schools of fish as collections of interacting organisms so these are now basically living particles they are not you know uh, physical particles but they are living particles so just like in magnetic spin spins want to point in same direction sort of minimize energy in the case of fish schools or bird flocks they also want to move in the same direction by aligning their direction of motion with one another so therefore flocks are also a collection of interacting organisms who are trying to move in the same direction and uh, but you know this parallel doesn't end here and in fact it, i think in my opinion ecology uh, in a way is actually even richer than physics for the following reason and which is that of evolution you know uh, think of two electrons this electron electron interactions or you know proton electron interactions these particle particle interactions uh, between physical particles they are always same they are not going to change electrons tomorrow will not or you know even after 100 years uh, will remain electrons and they will continue to uh, have the same coulomb's law of interactions right on the other hand that is not necessarily true when we think of biological organisms and why is why is that because biological organisms are subject to evolutionary forces for example it could be drift it could be natural selection and therefore depending on the consequence of the interactions on individual fitness these interactions may actually change over time and this is something that actually makes in my opinion ecological systems which is collection of many many organisms even more interesting and uh, and uh, uh, to study compared to physical systems and uh, these uh, evolutionary processes often cause a lot of variations a lot of heterogeneity so in some sense uh, i would like to think of ecology as you know a statistical physics of heterogeneous and evolving interacting you know units uh, where these units are basically living organisms and of course we know that because of this uh, you know uh, remarkable variations and uh, you know and heterogeneity and biodiversity we find that ecological phenomena are complex and they are complicated and of course have multi factorial causes any phenomenon we observe will have many factors that cause them okay so this in my opinion is the way ecology and physics especially the statistical physics have very rich rich parallels and however i want to emphasize that these parallels are not superficial superficial parallels they, you know, they don't appear same when we talk verbally they actually have a strong quantitative connection and i am going to try to demonstrate that uh, 
uh, you know, uh, using the examples of animal collectives in this talk. In our lab, we also study ecosystems. On the right hand side of this uh, slide, you are seeing an ecosystem of uh, patchy vegetation in uh, dry landscapes. And in fact, the many principles that I am, many, many principles I am going to talk about today are also as much applicable to these systems. But, to the, for, but for the purpose of today's talk, I'm going to restrict to the examples of animal collectives. Okay, and in fact, my own exposure to research as an undergraduate student began with something on these lines. You know, I was uh, working with a professor who was interested in statistical physics of vehicular traffic. And then, uh, and then that led me to work with him on a project on traffic in ant trails. You know, how do we mathematically, if, you know, if it is possible to mathematically model vehicular traffic, why can't we mathematically or computationally model traffic in ant trails? That was, in fact, my very first uh, research questions. And what we did there was, you know, we, we realized that, you know, ants are obviously very different from vehicles uh, in that they have something called pheromones, you know, that they eject as they move along, right? And this pheromone is a chemical that has its own dynamic. It has some lifetime and then it evaporates. So, and then the interaction between ants and ants and ants and pheromones is what leads to trail formation, okay? Uh, and we sort of studied this very interesting, interesting interplay between ant density and, uh, and how that leads to you know, stable uh, pheromone densities. And therefore we have, uh, you know, uh, stable traffic, you know, trail formation in ant colonies. I'm not going much more into this. Now I will move into some of our very recent work uh, that sort of uh, uh, continues to uh, use these principles in the context of uh, animals that move in groups. And here you are seeing a video of um, video of animals, many, many different species, birds, uh, fish, krills, and so on, which are all moving in groups. And uh, and not only uh, are they really sort of, you know, showing remarkable patterns in their movement, uh, they also show some sort of universal principles. You know, you, either you see uh, fish, you know, or krill schools or, or the starling flocks, when a predator attacks, they seem to show some similar type of patterns and behaviors. Likewise, what you're seeing in this specific uh, frame here is a computer simulation demonstration of how those kind of patterns can be nicely mimicked by using computer simulations. Okay, so, and therefore there is potential for to study these kind of systems using quantitative skills that are often not sort of, you know, the uh, mainstream in much of biological research. Okay, so now with that sort of broad background, uh, where I hope I have sort of tried to convince you that there is interesting parallel between ecology and physics, and, uh, and that uh, collective uh, motion of animal groups uh, actually provides a sort of a, almost a ideal sort of uh, example that makes this connection. So what I will now do is I will actually go over uh, simple ways, simple mathematical and computational ways by which we can understand this collective motion in animal groups. Okay, having done that, what I will then do is I will try to sort of show some example of experimental work that we have done in the lab, where again using some mathematical and physics ideas, we show that stochasticity that we observe in animal groups can be used as a signal to understand animal animal interactions okay and if i have time i will also talk about our ongoing work on the dynamics of collective motion under predation in under natural conditions okay, so here are the key questions that we are often interested when we think of collective motion first is that how do organisms exhibit these remarkable motion patterns right so uh, uh, one is of course you know when we see this collective motion pattern every time i see them i find them very fascinating just aesthetically visually right and secondly from a scientific point of view how is it that you know without you know these large number of organisms show this some kind of striking pattern formation uh, is it that they have a leader that sort of 
directs them like you know uh, uh, you know like in the context of you know marches right you know there are leaders they are well trained and they are asked to do exactly this 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 when these this happen right do they have a leader like that you know uh, maybe in some cases it doesn't seem likely in many other cases you know uh, therefore and, and, and organisms in general only have very local information they can see their neighbors right they can uh, see their neighbors movement but they can't see what's really happening at really far distance and they you know because there are many many other individuals so despite those limitations they actually show these remarkable patterns we can also ask why do the organ why do organisms exhibit collective motion we know that not every organism shows these kind of patterns some organisms do but many many organisms do not right uh, so what makes some organisms show these behaviors and uh, and on what, what makes others do not show these behaviors so to understand those questions we have to look at the evolutionary causes what are the costs of being in group what are the benefits of being in group and does it make sense for organisms to be in groups given the costs and benefits that uh, that actually they are going to get from get being in groups of okay so for today's talk i am mostly going to focus on the first question how do organisms exhibit remarkable collective motion and uh, because my interest was in making more connections to physics i have uh, i know i have decided to stick to only the first part of the uh, question today okay so now um, let me introduce you some very classic computational models that people came up with now what is very interesting about collective motion as a research field is that uh, some of the very early work that where people were thinking you know how can we explain these how can we explain these patterns of uh, uh, you know organization in animal groups actually came not from biology but from other disciplines in fact some of the very early work was actually done in the computer science literature because they were interested in making animation movies and they wanted to animate and they realized that i can't animate hundreds of animals moving together you know it's so difficult to hand draw all of them right uh, in 80s for example you know it was going to be quite a bit of a task to uh, you know uh, to draw so many animals over uh, to remarkable accuracy in fact uh, many of you might remember uh, a really uh, uh, amazing scene of stampede from the movie lion king which came i think in early 90s uh, in fact that was one of the very first uh usages of these type of these type of mathematical models in an entirely commercial context but even then uh, it was not so prevalent in the research context and uh, one of the very early research papers that sort of took an interest from a physics point of view was by vichek et al which was published in physical review letters in 1995 and then later on in the biology literature uh, by ian cousin and so on and since then there have been an explosion of mathematical models that tries to explain these behaviors so let me now try to explain the essence of these models what are these you know these models assume that uh, organisms you i'm showing a cartoon picture of a bunch of fish here the first assumption that these models make is that these complex organisms can be represented by um, very simple points or ob point like objects or maybe sphere like objects in a computer okay for example i'm going to simplify the complex geometry of fish into a disk uh, that i have just shown you as a representation okay now having done that now basically there are a whole bunch of disks let us focus on the focal disk the one that i have shown in green color what this uh, what this uh, animal represented by disk does is basically follow some fairly simple local rules so the circle that i have drawn represents probably a region where animals the animal can sense uh, other animals presence and their movement okay so what does what does an animal probably do it follows two or three very simple rules first one is to stay in group uh, to make sure the group is cohesive animals locally attract with one another secondly to move in an aligned and polarized fashion they also align the direction of motion it's not enough to be cohesive but it also have to move in a way that everybody is moving in the same direction right so what you do is you look at your 
local neighbors like you know for example in this case there are four individuals around you right around this green disk take an average of the velocities of all the four individuals and then follow the average of the four of your neighbors that would be an example of local alignment and finally of course you don't want to bump into each other right and, and of course and in addition real organisms do make perfect decisions and there is always stochasticity so add some stochasticity so you put these fairly simple rules and write them, write them in the form of equations and these equations would look like what we what we learned as newton's laws for example in our high school except that the forces that make these fish move are not biological or not, not physical forces like gravitation or electro electromagnetic forces but these are social forces because animals want to follow these three sort of attraction alignment repulsion rules one can think of them as social forces not physical forces okay and then you put these uh, you know rules together and you implement those these rules repeatedly via in the with the help of computers and uh, and in fact i just want to emphasize again that um, the analogy i told you in the beginning about magnetic spins and these are not really superficial the main difference uh, is the fact that electronic spins are stuck on lattice of atoms and they don't move whereas fish of course moves right uh, so apart from that much of the basic principles between the two are similar okay in terms of the alignment dynamics so if you now uh, simulate these rules on a computer you find that we can actually reproduce uh, you know many realistic looking patterns of animal groups depending on the density of animals depending on how strongly these forces are present for example if stochasticity is on the higher side what you will see is something like a on the other hand the stochasticity is low but if the strength of alignment is very strong what you see is uh, the bottom right corner which is the d panel d some somewhere in between uh, you will see panel b where you have sufficient number of uh, attraction but there's also some amount of stochasticity therefore they're not all going in the same direction uh, there are groups that are locally formed and they also merge and split with many many other groups and these kind of patterns shown in you know panel b sort of premix uh, may i know the the fission fusion groups we see in the real world and you know uh, let me show one more interesting pattern we observed so the the pattern you are now seeing here is basically more like a swarm pattern like a mosquito swarm they don't have directionality they are just you know going in and out in as sort of a ball right on the other hand if they are very strongly aligned if they have a very strong strength of aligning with each other they will form a group but they will also move in the same direction okay here is something very interesting the third case i have just shown you now which is that all the uh, you know animals here in the simulation they're actually going in circles you know uh, and that happens when there is a certain optimum uh, i mean optimum is a maybe a wrong usage here certain specific ratios of the strengths of attraction and orientation okay how well i want to be cohesive and how much do i want to align with my neighbors if there is some appropriate combinations of these two parameters you also end up getting these kind of uh you know you know donut like uh, or you know spiral you know milling like patterns of organisms moving let me just show you some examples of you know what happens if you simulate them on computer here is a very simple example of a highly polarized group movement here's an example of a more like a swarm they're together but they're not moving in a highly polarized way because for these guys the attraction is the stronger force than the orientation there's also a third one i'm going to show here below here the blue individuals know some information that the others don't know so blue individuals know that they have to go to the right side of the screen uh, but the green individuals don't know green will just and uh, green individuals are just following their neighbors they don't even know who is blue and who is green they're just following their neighbors so just following you know neighbors without knowing who is the leader let's call the blue as leaders can still lead to a lot of you know uh, migratory like behaviors so these these simple computational models actually can make very interesting predictions okay so now i want to make a couple of uh, points here uh, first and foremost uh, this kind of a milling pattern is not only found in mathematical models we also observe them in real world 
right? And uh, one very interesting point to note here is that to observe a pattern where fish are moving in a donut-like fashion, we did not assume that fish have to go in circles. We just assume that if fish follows their neighbor's direction and if fish follows cohesion rule and under some conditions, they spontaneously form these ghost go in circle kind of behaviors. Although the equations themselves had no such rule. And these kind of properties are what we call emergent properties. This is a property of the collective that was not really defined at the level of individual. Individuals were did not have a rule that you have to go in circles. They were the only rule for individual was just follow your neighbors. But by repeatedly doing this, what we found was that they can actually go in circles. So it was a property that was not present at the level of individuals, but we see them only at the level of groups and we call them emergent properties. And, uh, and there are lots of parallels uh, between emergent property in animal groups and in physics. For example, when we think of solid, liquid, magnet, and even temperature, these properties cannot be defined at the level of individuals. However, they make sense only when we think of a collective and therefore they're all actually emergent properties. So uh, with that sort of uh, note, let's come back to what we have found so far. The, the simple computational models where we assume that fish are like a disk that follows three simple rules makes a prediction. But you know, very simple local, local interaction rules among animals can cause collective movement. Okay, but one can ask the question, hey, look, that's your uh, mathematical model prediction. But how do I know what do real animals do? Do real animals actually follow the kind of simple interactions you assumed? Or do they do much more complex? Okay, so let us try to answer, uh, you know, uh, address this question. Before I do so, let me just remind and uh, ho I hope that I have clarified to some extent um, this issue of, you know, how people misunderstand what's ecology and that, you know, why the kind of questions in ecology are also of interest to uh, physicists and even those physicists who use pen, paper and equations and computers. And finally, the third point about mathematical models and statistical models. So the example I gave you now of fish moving and we assume some rules about fish, that's an example of a mathematical or a computational model. And those models make a prediction and those are called mathematical models. In contrast, we also have statistical models. Statistical models are very different in the sense that we use them to sort of test whether two data sets uh, have similar properties or not. When two, and it is really to test whether two data sets have similar properties or not, we use statistical models. In that sense, they are very, very fundamentally different. So now let's come back to the question I posed, which is how do, what do, what do real organisms do? How do they interact with one another? Let me now show you this video. This video has been taken in our lab. So these are uh, species of fish called karimi. They are found in uh, uh, coastal areas in uh, Kerala. And uh, if you just throw them in a tank, fish tank, they just do this. You know, I'm, we are not providing them any stimulus. Uh, you know, uh, and we have just put them in fish tank under their natural uh, sort of you know naturalish. You know, of course their natural condition is somewhat brackish water. Here in our lab, that's not the case. That apart, you know, they are in similar temperatures, similar lighting conditions and so on. And they show these kind of behaviors. Uh, we can now, now ask the same question. Is the mathematical or computational model I showed you, is that really right for this? Is it really true? How are fish really moving when they are showing, you know, when they are moving and behaving like this in the group? Are they looking at average of neighbors and moving in the average direction? Or are they doing something more complicated? As you see, you know, there are really remarkable and interesting patterns that this is showing. Uh, what can we, how can we make sense of this? Uh, of course, this is a really, really challenging problem, right? So unlike electrons and electrons, like, you know, uh, electron problem of electron and electron, this is a much, much more challenging problem uh, because these are real organisms. Uh, when I'm observing hundreds, uh, tens of uh, schooling fish, how can I really say something about what each fish is doing? That's a very non-trivial problem. Uh, on the other hand, one can maybe think of doing experiments with a very small number of fish or birds and try to make some sense of interactions between them. But that's also very challenging. It's possible that animals may show some behavior when they're in very small groups, but they may do something entirely different when they're in a group of 100 again, right? So, so this is actually a very challenging problem. How do we infer interactions 
between organisms by observing the collective behavior. And uh, uh, so to address this question, um, there are many methods people have thought about and uh, uh, people have worked on. And, uh, and let me now show what we have found in our work. And uh, before I go further, let me make a few general remarks. First is that when we say we want to understand what are fish doing in to maintain this group behavior and to show this group behaviors, it really sort of bit depends on what is the scale at which I am asking this question. Uh, is it a group size of 15, 20, 30, or is it really um, uh, at much larger scales? Uh, uh, am I asking about the group cohesion? Am I asking questions about group polarization? By polarization, I mean all of them moving in the same direction. Okay, so and also it also depends on the ecological context when they are foraging and predating, uh, when they are under the threat of predation, their forces might again be very different. Okay, so their interactions may again be very different. So therefore, so the ecological context as well as the scale are both really important. So in our work, we ask these specific questions: What explains the dynamics of group polarization? You know, uh, when we see these flocks. The thing that really captures our mind is not only the fact that the animal groups are tightly packed, they're actually very, uh, they're actually synchronously moving. And it's about the synchronous motion that I'm most interested in. And uh, hence, our interest uh, in the questions I'm going to ask in the following uh, few, uh, uh, for this set of slides would be on the direction, on the rules of direction and alignment in collective motion. And in, in doing so, I'm going to sort of try to convince you uh, that, you know, the stochasticity we see is actually uh, can be used as signal uh, to infer animal interactions. Okay, so what is the basic principle of inferring, uh, you know, uh, how fish interact from observations of the collective? This is a very important question. And how do we even go think about this? Okay, so now one way to think about this is the following, you know, um, assume that we consider a zoo of interaction. For example, consider first model. In the first model, we assume that fish will interact only with one neighbor. And then using that, uh, that kind of a model, we make predictions about some measurable quantity. Okay. Let's call that Q. I haven't written that Q, let's call that Q. Now, now think of another model where maybe fish will now interact with two neighbors, not one neighbor. And again, make predictions about some measurable quantity. Uh, we need, we now need to make sure that the measurable quantity in one and two are actually a bit different. If they're going to be of same pattern, then I can't distinguish between model one and two. And likewise, we keep on, we need to produce a whole bunch of models. And for each of the model, for example, the nth model I have written here is that uh, fish interact with average of neighbors in a given neighborhood. Neighborhood might have 10 fish. So in that case, it actually does an averaging behavior. Now, for this model again, make predictions about some measurable quantity. Now, and then we measure these quantities and see which of the uh, predictions about this quantity Q is observed in real data. And only those type of interaction models are most appropriate. So that's the basic idea that you follow uh, uh, because As I mentioned, you know, there are lots of challenges, you know, in understanding how fish interact with one another or uh, not just fish, it could be true for any other organism that we want to study uh, by observing collectives. Okay, so now comes to the, I'm going to first explain in this part what the experiments we did, what do we measure and what's the underlying theory we use. So here is something very interesting that I want to emphasize again that to interpret experimental data, we actually need a very solid theory and the predictions of the theory. <clears throat> so this is how we do experiments. We have a fish tank of uh, you know diameter 180 centimeters, and uh, <clears throat> and here I'm showing you an example of a uh, <clears throat> you know an image of uh, 60 fish moving in a fish tank. And what we do with the fish moving is you know in this uh, zoomed in version you are seeing this. Uh, lines right what the, these basically lines represent the trajectories that we are able to construct so the basic idea is once you have a high resolution video of fish moving uh, we can actually construct the x and y coordinate the position of each fish as a function of time where was each fish at each 
frame of our video and then we make you know these connecting lines and therefore we basically have trajectories of all the fish in the tank so now once at once we have done this step this is really crucial this is called the image processing and object detection and tracking yeah, for this we really use uh, techniques from computer science and uh, once we have trajectories of 60 fish right a fish becomes irrelevant in some sense this could be trajectories of 60 particles right you know because trajectories could be of fish could be of worms could be of some other animal uh, but the point is that we have trajectories of 60 particles now and we can begin to use ideas from physics of trajectories and uh, how do we make sense of trajectories okay so here is how our, our experiment looks like uh, this is an example of i think group size 30 um, <clears throat> okay and uh, what we have done experiments uh, are also with group size 15 and 60 for each group size we have done experiments three to four times depending on the feasibility we record this for about 45 minutes and for each of these videos uh, as i showed in the previous uh, example we collect we sort of you know we extract the trajectories of fish okay uh, here is an example of how, how how it looks like once we have extracted trajectories and then once we have the trajectories we know the speed and velocity of each fish right so it's basically like you know going back to high school if you know the position of a particle over time i can calculate the velocity of the particle over time right and that velocity is basically vi in this equation here i hope you can see this go to mark this this vi basically is the you know uh, velocity of the particle at each time step tn <clears throat> okay and then uh, and then from each velocity what we do is we calculate a quantity called group polarization m so what does this really mean this quantity m actually will be zero if all the fish are moving in random directions because when fish are moving in random directions the velocity is they are pointed in the arbitrary directions therefore if you add them up it becomes zero on the other hand if fish are all more roughly moving in the same direction this quantity becomes close to one okay so basically therefore by measuring this quantity m group polarization we can tell how ordered these fish schools are and then what we do is we calculate this quantity as a function of time so i just want to emphasize that the data we have really here is really remarkably large we know the <clears throat> we know this quantity of group polarization um, for you know at, at the interval of 0.1 second Okay, and we know this for about one hour and we have four replicates of this for each of the experimental you know experimental sizes that we have here 15 30 and 60. what we are showing here what i'm showing here you is basically a six minute window and as you can see there are massive fluctuations right you know fish obviously they don't they don't stay still uh, and uh, they show remarkable variations and uh, and we have some really high quality data at a very high or resolution in space and time and here is uh, what i am showing for 50 on the left panel or the left vertical panel 30 for the middle vertical panel and group size 60 let's just focus on 15 here okay uh, what you are seeing is this is a you know time series of this group polarization what we have plotted let's now focus on this g here what i am plotting here is the frequency distribution of this experimentally calculated quantity you know this frequency distribution looks you know uh, you know has a peak or a mode at value close to one and remember this value of m close to one means that the fish are moving in a highly polarized fashion they are all ordered they're moving in the same direction okay <clears throat> and therefore the mode is somewhere close to one here on the other hand look at group size 60 the mode has slightly shifted mode is still close to one the mode has slightly shifted and you know the distribution is now much much wider this means that the group size 60 is showing less order on an average compared to group size 50 okay <clears throat> and this we are able to calculate based on very high resolution data okay but remember all of this really is data at the level of groups 
what I have shown you in the previous slide was basically property of the entire group. But I am interested in finding out how are fish talking, to, not talking, you know, uh, interacting with one another. Can we sort of uh, infer something about individual level rules based on this very highly stochastic, you know, noisy data, not in terms of measurement noise, noisy because of entirely intrinsic noise. <laughs> okay, that's where the theory and methods uh, uh, becomes really crucial. What we do is the following. I'm showing you two graphs here, by the way. Um, observe these two graphs very closely, the left one and the right one. The polarization here is going back and forth, highly fluctuating on the left side, and that's exactly true on the right side. Let us now plot the frequency distribution of this data. The frequency distribution shows very similar features for both the left side data and the right side side data. But let me tell you something very, very interesting, which is that the left side data I obtained from computer simulations where the fish were interacting in a pairwise fashion. Okay. The right side data I'm showing you from a simulation where fish were interacting in an average manner, meaning an individual fish is not looking at only one fish, but it actually looks at many, many fish and does an average and then moves. So in some sense, the left side panel and right side panel data come from very different underlying interaction. However, if you look at, if you observe their time series and if you observe their histograms, they look very similar. Of course, there are differences, um, you, know, uh, you know, but it's not very evident. You know, how do you really capture them in a way uh, that's robust? So uh, let me now define what I mean by this pairwise interaction model. In a pairwise interaction model, two fish are moving and one of the fish decides to move in the direction of other fish. In addition, they also stochastically keep turning. In a ternary interaction model, they do something very interesting. For example, here is a fish, focal fish, which is sort of slightly misaligned from the other two fish. So therefore, what this fish does in the next moment is turns towards these guys. And this is happening basically because if each fish sort of does an average of the neighborhood, you will get an effect of this type where you go towards the majority of your neighborhood. So in that sense, the pairwise interaction and this ternary or average interactions are sort of fundamentally different interactions. Okay. So now imagine that I have only given you this time series, which is what the experiments are also giving you, right? How can you say whether the data came from uh, pairwise interaction fish or was it from a ternary interaction fish model? So to do this, we have come up with a mathematical theory and uh, what we uh, what we calculate is something called an average force. Okay, and uh, you know that's a bit tricky to explain. So let me try my best. So the basic idea of this, you know, depending on the current polarization of the group, this average force function will be linear if it's a pairwise interaction model. So for a pairwise interaction model, basically, uh, you will you will find that this force function is a linear function, and this force function can be computed from a time series data. On the other hand, if you have a ternary interaction model, this force function is a cubic function. So therefore, here we have a case where there are two very simple collective behavior model. One is a pairwise interaction model, other is a ternary interaction model. In the pairwise interaction model, the force, fun the, you know, the force function is a linear function, whereas in the ternary interaction model, it's a cubic function. So if I can somehow manage to compute these force functions from data, then and then if and then I will be able to tell which of the two is correct. And in fact, uh, and we can do a bit more further. I'm going to skip this, uh, you know, skip this slide because we can do it in a much more mathematical way analytically. I'm not going to go into those details here. And you know, remember that this was the data we had. I don't know if the force function is linear or cubic, and that's what we want to find. And then there is actually we came up with a very nice method to construct this, these force functions. And then what we found was indeed uh, this force function is actually linear. You know, here uh, uh, you know what we are finding is actually it's a planar, planar and linear are basically same. So uh, that's a, you know that's a distinction between one dimension and two dimension anyway. Uh, and you know what we find is that indeed this force function that we calculate from data is actually 
uh, planar function or a linear function. Uh, this function is also called a drift function in the sort of you know in the physics sort of terminology. And what we find is that this is actually a planar function for all the three group sizes, not just for one group size. For all the group sizes, this for, you know this function is planar but not cubic. And uh, and uh, and remember that you know uh, pairwise interaction model actually made this prediction, right? Pairwise interaction model. We go back to these few slides. Pairwise interaction model said that uh, this force function must be linear, whereas cubic interaction model said that the force function must be cubic. So therefore, what we are saying is that what we can infer an, an, from these analysis and these theory is that our fish that we studied in the lab most likely show a very dominant, uh, you know, level of linear. Uh, you know, dominant uh, mode of pairwise interactions, and even if ternary interactions are present, they are probably very weak, and therefore we are actually not seeing the cubic nature of the force function at all. So I'm going to skip some of the mathematical details here, okay? And uh, and uh, so, so I'll summarize this part. I think I have already run out of time now for 15 minutes. Um, so by by looking at fine scale individual level behavior, what we can uh, you know, by, by having these detailed, you know, detailed trajectories, uh, we can make the following inference at the very, very fine scale, fish follow simple pairwise stochastic interactions. This is actually in contrast to many, many previous computational models which assume local averaging. The very first model I introduced to you uh, using the cartoon pictures, they also assume this local averaging. What we find is that the fish actually seem, seem, seem to follow even simpler interactions than what the models actually assumed. And secondly, we also came up with a method to construct, um, you know, uh, these force functions from high resolution time series data. And this is largely the work of my PhD student, Jitesh Jhavar. Um, and then in addition to the sort of uh, work, work that, uh, you know, one second, please. Uh, so I'm, I'm showing you here, this is the work of my another PhD student, where we are looking at the collective behavior of black buck herds uh, in the natural habitats. Okay. I hope you're all able to see that there are some things that are moving there. The things that are moving there are actually black buck, uh, which is an antelope species found in uh, various parts of India, especially in the semi-arid uh, grassland areas. And uh, what we are now trying to understand is that in these type of groups, which are actually the natural conditions, can we understand how do organisms interact with one another and how do they respond to threats like predation? And in this specific, exper you know, in this specific video, what you really saw was, I'm replaying the video now, what you saw was that there was a mild um, sort of a threat that happened to them, which was, uh, one of the student uh, actually walked towards them slowly. And then uh, some of the black bug observe that and they see it as a threat and they move away. And then the student immediately stops. And then we observe therefore sort of a, you know, uh, a controlled perturbation uh, and the response of the herds to these kind of uh, perturbations in the natural world. So we're trying to understand this, you know, I don't have time to go through this in detail. And uh, to summarize my initial part of the talk where I was trying to make connections between ecology and physics, uh, for those who are interested, I encourage you to read these two articles. The first one is an article I wrote in Resonance in 2014, where I explained uh, my perspective of how ecology can be viewed as individuals to collectives. Of course, this is by no means my original perspective. There are many people who have thought about this before. And more recently, uh, which is just this year in current science, Karthik Shankar, my colleague in CES, and I wrote, um, you know, a, a, an article in current science, uh, sort of arguing that, you know, there are some very interesting complementary ways to think about philosophy and practice of organismal science and suborganismal science, where we basically argue that there is uh, both in terms of philosophy and practice, there is a uh, difference between the two. In terms of uh, philosophy and uh, uh, because of the focus on these collectives uh, in organismal biology, uh, whereas there is a focus on reductionism 
treatment mechanism in suborganism biology. And this is not to say that there are no areas of, of, of suborganism biology where the collective is collective focus is uh, not present, and likewise uh, the vice versa. Uh, so for those who are interested, I uh, you know I would be happy to send the. Uh, uh, articles. Uh, with that note, I would like to thank uh, two students whose work I mainly presented, Jitesh Shawar, who is currently a postdoc at Max Planck, and uh, Akanksha, who will be very soon finishing her PhD and will also be joining a postdoc at Max Planck uh, in an institute in Germany. Uh, and also many uh, collaborators and funding agencies. And uh, thank you all and thank you so much for the invitation. I'm happy to take questions now. Thank you, Vishwesh. It was an amazing talk. I think everyone's mind would be shaken by now. So there should be some questions. So I think we are open for the question session. So people can raise their hands and ask. So there is a question in uh, the question answer box mm -hmm. by Gopi Krishnan. Okay that how do the individuals regroup to original state after getting split following a predator's attack or any other disturbance? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, in fact, that is also what we are trying to investigate in the context of black bug. How do organisms group back uh, after a predatory attack? So there are uh, two possibilities here. One is that, you know, in there are many cases where the regrouping may be actually not even possible if they are totally split and it may also it may also not matter for example there are many organisms which live in uh, what we call fission fusion societies in these fission fusion societies the group membership is not constant uh, you know animals join and leave groups to join some other groups and two groups can merge and two groups mm -hmm. can split so in those societies uh, the group membership is not permanent and therefore, a split that may have happened post uh, predatory attack is not, not of fundamental consequence to organisms. Uh, but now there are other organisms, like you know, they live in very strong uh, so with a social bonds, such as you know, many primate societies, where if there was indeed a split, it may become imperative that they do join back. Uh, and uh, in many of the societies, they may also have fairly significant uh, component of memory of the landscape, memory of the frequently used um, areas by the group and, uh, and, uh, and sort of, you know, pheromones and these kind of mechanisms help them regroup. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Vishwish. Now, Nikhil has a question. So I think Nikhil can, Nikhil can unmute and ask the question. Sure. Uh, am I audible? Yes. Yes. I wish you amazing talk and very nice work. Thank you very and, much. Uh, so I wanted to ask if there is any limitation to these mathematical models and are there any possible alternatives to it? For example, uh, flamingos, they show a relatively static movement, right? They don't really, uh, I mean, when they are on land. Mm -hmm. So how do you model movement of these groups that are relatively slower or are there any other possible possibilities? So, uh, the, the, so the general question is, you know, are there limitations of mathematical models? Every mathematical model has a limitation, you know, you know by design. Uh, by design, we assume a lot of things that are unrealistic, right? So, but we, by design, we also focus on things that we want to focus on. For example, in the work that I presented, I was trying to focus on group polarization, right? Therefore, I ignored everything that I thought might come in the way of understanding it. So, uh, it is both a strength that we ignore a lot of things, but it is also a weakness that we ignore a lot of things. So I think we have to use very cautiously. So for example, uh, now uh, so that was a general comment. Now coming to your specific question. Now, if you wanted to model flamingos, which which don't move as much, right? So then in those models, speed of organisms uh, will be less. So you can take the same model that I have, for example, used assume there that you know speed is much less or maybe even zero for a large part and uh, but however the cohesion is important otherwise they will eventually split right so the cohesion there is more important than the alignment because the directionality is not even relevant because they're not even moving 
right? So I think one can modify it. So basically, there one can think of these models as as a framework, okay? And then you sort of use the framework to sort of build more specific models that are applicable to your system of interest. Right. Thank you. Uh, I think there is a question from some anonymous attendee. I will just read it. Sure. Uh, does relative physiological state of individuals based on age or sex determine how they can match each other moments in nature? Does the stochasticity arise from this? Uh, how does the physiological state of individuals? Yeah. Okay. Individuals yeah. Affect. Yeah. That's a great question. You know, so we do know that uh, uh, it's, this is a context dependent question. For example, for some functions, yes, uh, it does matter. The physiological state matters, but but imagine just you know one can just argue it out fairly easily in the following way. For example, if you if a group is cohesive, right, and the group members don't get lost, they have to match speed. Otherwise, there's just no way, right? Right, you know, if a group is cohesive and if it's a mobile group, they unless they actually match the speed, there's just no way they can even stay cohesive. Right? Otherwise, they will end up losing group members. And in fact, this is actually a strategy used by many, many organisms to sort of uh, leave out uh, individuals who are sick. So sick individuals are often unable to match the speed. And that's how they actually naturally, uh, you know, uh, get sort of, you know, uh, sort of, you know, drop out of the groups. And therefore, the infectious diseases actually don't spread as much as you would think they should spread. Uh, so yeah, physiological state does matter uh, typically in these kind of cases, uh, uh, but but in some sense, almost by necessity of group cohesion, uh, independent of uh, sort of you know uh, naturally reasonable physio physiological uh, sort of uh, variables, uh, they actually seem to match very well. And in uh, there are actually studies in baboon group that show that uh, you know the internal hierarchy even within a group, they don't quite matter when it comes to collective movement and decision that animals make on where to go for it, which is the next foraging site to go, right? For that decision often doesn't really depend on, uh, you know, uh, uh, the dominant individuals or hierarchies. Often it is determined by much more universal principles of collective decision making. Mm -hmm. And now Karthik has a question. So I think uh, Karthik, you can unmute and ask the question. Ah, yeah. Hi, Vishwesh. Hi. Hi, hi Karthik. Hi. So I just want to know, actually, I have uh, two questions. Uh, I am just typing the second one. So I'll ask you the first one. Have uh, invasion front of invasions, invasive species been modeled and what does it inform us? Well, there have been uh, tons and tons of models. I'm to the extent that I am hardly familiar with the literature. And... Uh, I know, for example, just the basic sort of textbook-like results. Uh, for example, some of the very early work on invasion fronts were by uh, Skellum and Fisher in 1950s, uh, where they sort of showed that what is the velocity of the front as a function of various biological parameters like growth rate, intrinsic growth rate, and the diffusion of organisms. Uh, so there are these classic results in uh, 1950s. And then, and those have been used to understand boundaries between uh, different, uh, all the way from boundaries between an invasive species front and the, say the native area to understanding, uh, you know, uh, distribution of biomes. So they, those frameworks have been very successful. And uh, in fact, with one of my former undergrad students, I worked on how those models uh, actually can help us explain savanna forest boundaries on a continental scale. Okay. okay, so that's one type of work. There has been a lot of work. A more specific to invasion, there's another very important result. It says that the dispersal kernel actually plays a very important role in how fast the front moves. Uh, for example, if it's a diffusive dispersal, a Gaussian dispersal of seeds, for example, then that the diffusion front moves at a constant speed. So constant speed. However, if the seed dispersal is a fat tail dispersal, uh, a non-Gaussian uh, kernel wave which has a fat tail, 
in those systems this uh, front invasion front can actually accelerate and that can obviously have dramatic influence on uh, how fast the invasion happens right so that's another classic result i am saying here but you know there is so much work that are both general as well as species specific that you know i am really not the competent to answer a very good very specific, you know much more than this yeah the thanks for that uh, I, my second question is about subterranean fauna you have almost a, like a three dimensional movement mm. which is possible in the subterranean uh, strata mm -hmm. while on the on the surface it's a two dimensional yeah. uh, how does that impose uh, and uh, and you have limitations on how fast and how uh, difficult it is to traverse subterranean uh, media so how do you uh, what is the uh, outcome of the models that might uh, predict movement in these two areas uh, how would they compare uh, animals moving underground and on surface okay yeah, that's a great question uh, so see the, the the videos i so showed you i just want to i didn't make this point very clear the videos of fish school i showed you was actually effectively a uh, a two dimensional uh, movement of fish on a surface uh, we did that by ensuring that the the water in the experimental tank was very shallow okay so therefore it was really not the case that there were two layers of fish school there were literally one layer of fish schools occasionally they will of course jump or you know, go below each other but those events are rare that was intentional design and why was it so because to study three dimensional uh, Uh, animal movement structure is incredibly more difficult uh, technologically both in laboratory as well as even more so in the field so for this reason the number of studies have been really really you know one can literally count them on fingertips how many studies have actually looked at uh, collective motion of animals in a three dimensional world is just incredibly small and uh, we do know that from modeling studies that the fluid dynamical um, a role might be much more uh, important in the three dimensional world especially in the natural world with currents and so on um uh, are that usually don't play any role let's say when black buck is moving on a terrestrial landscape thanks now complication you can then you can ask the question Um, hi. Uh, one more question I have that is, uh, say for example, when two leading individuals of a group spot a predator, and uh, if both of them take two opposite directions to escape, and uh, what about the following individuals? Which direction they would take if they are equidistantly placed between these two leaders? Yeah, that's a fabulous question. So what we observe, you know, uh, the black buck uh, her video I showed, one video I showed. This was a question that we were also interested, you know, in that uh, video. You know, in a large number of cases, what we observe is the following: um, even when the, two, the imagine there is a spread of black buck over landscape. Uh, imagine that the initially before uh, our perturbation experiment happened, they were sort of separated into small, two small, two subgroups with some area in between. what we observed in a in many number of cases is the following the first thing they do is actually merge and then they run okay that even even if the merging might involve coming closer to the position of the threat they actually seem to merge first before they actually run away that's what we have observed and of course uh, it actually makes uh, does make some sense you know we know that when animals are in bigger groups there is a lesser chance of any individual being caught right so this is called dilution effect uh, the probability of a focal individual being caught in a group size of n is 1 over n so the larger the n is always going to be better even though larger groups are easier to detect even though uh, for a predator larger group might mean that i have one uh, because the predator only needs one anyway right it might actually ensure higher chance of predation success for uh, you know it it will still mean a better chance of survival for the uh, prey thank you thank you so much
Mm, now I think one question is from Pragyadeep. So Pragyadeep, you can unmute yourself. Hi, Vishu. Hi. Hi, it was a really nice talk. So I had one question. Uh, so uh, uh, have there been similar attempts to model nucleotide substitution which are linked? I mean, uh, which, uh, do, do you see any, I mean, my, it is my question to you. I mean, I would like to know your opinion. So do you see any uh, similar similarity between the uh, pattern of nucleotide substitutions and collective behavior of organisms? I mean, can uh, similar models be applied to study new, to the study the pattern of uh, evolution of nucle of nucleotide? Do you think it can be done? As in, uh, we do do see a lot of genes that are linked, and they evolve at the same pace. And do you think there have been any attempts that have been made to sort of uh, uh, model? model this sort of pattern? I don't know. I mean, of course, you are also aware that there are lots of mathematical models of nucleotide substitutions and evolution at the level of genes and nucleotides, right? Exactly. Uh, I don't yeah. know whether the, the linkages there can be mapped to the collective behavior of the type that I was talking about. That I am not very familiar with. Okay. I'm, I'm not aware. I can't think of any study that comes to my mind. Uh, Okay, all right. Cool. Karthik has one more question, so Karthik can ask. Yeah, uh, Vishwa, huh? hello. Yeah, can yeah, you... I can hear. I can hear. Yeah, 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 sorry. Yeah. I can hear. So I, I just wanted to know. This is just a curiosity question. Uh, say, if you were to explore life on Mars, <laughs> what would be the uh, strategies? Given that most life. If they do exist, they tend to move. Uh, yeah, I actually don't know. I mean, I don't know the answer. Um, so you're saying, how do we uh, detect life that may exist on Mars? Is that the question? And in that, in doing so, how will one use the fact that they actually move? Is that, is that your question? Yeah, yeah. Huh, okay, okay. Yeah. yeah, so I think this question maybe can map to the question of search, right? So there is this, uh, you know, in ecology, there is this famous uh, sort of, you know, in the context of foraging, there is a huge literature on the search literature, right? Let's say I'm an animal who don't know where my next food source is going to come from, okay? Uh, I am, let's say, in a sparse resource, okay? Of course, in high resource landscape, this question is meaningless. Um, yes, I'm in a sparse resource landscape and I don't know where my next resource is going to come How should I move to increase my chance of detecting the next food source, right? Do you think there is a mapping between this question and the one that you asked? So for example, if I'm exploring a uh, life on Mars, uh, which um, uh, by a robot, using a robot, right? Yes. A yes. robotic vehicle, uh, but the life is going to be probably very, very sparse. Uh, what kind of a strategy should uh, uh, robot use to sort of detect uh, we should have the highest chance of detecting yes. if there was indeed a, yeah. uh, a life, right? So this question is similar to a predator, for example, trying to find a very sparse prey in an unknown landscape, right? So in fact, this question has actually been studied in this predator-prey context. What it, it turns out that the solution, there is no one unique answer to this. It depends on the movement strategy of the prey itself. For example, if the prey is moving in a diffusive way, Know, sort of you know very brownian motion type of walking then uh, i don't remember the exact answer now i know i have read a paper that sort of tries to ask this question then it is uh, then one must actually follow a levy walk i think and vice versa uh, so there actually there's actually a study i think that seems to map the question that you okay. uh, asked yeah Thanks. yeah so we have one question from anonymous attendee so i will read it what would your guess be about the generality of principles guiding collective behavior across taxonomic groups? Does it depend on sensory mechanisms of these taxa? Yeah, I think the answer is both uh, yes and no. So there are certainly clear general mm -hmm. principles of how 
local interactions can scale to collective properties. But it is also absolutely true that uh, sensory modalities will matter. For now, or the mechanism by which organisms interact will matter. For example, take the case of cells. They are going to probably interact with either chemicals, right? Which could be sometimes mm -hmm. longer range than just what the vision can allow. Will have, the equivalent of vision mm -hmm. would have allowed, allowed right? Uh, it mm -hmm. could be tactile. Tactile is extremely local. If it was a tactile interaction, it would have been extremely local. Again, think of ants. And many ants mm -hmm. are blind, but they have pheromones. So they use a combination of tactile, uh, you know, sensory uh, perception together with, uh, you know, sensing the pheromone trail. Okay. And then now think of fish. Fish do, do use neither tactile uh, or, uh, you know, uh, or, uh, or most likely no smell that they, they do you they do seem to use smell uh, but uh, but not you not in not when they're probably schooling so they do they use for example uh, vision to a large extent fish they may also use the lateral lining to sense the pressure of the water so the mechanisms do matter i think in my opinion to understand certain specific properties of collective movement uh, for example fish don't follow a trail like ants do it seems like that's probably a property of combination of uh, ant pheromone structure, or the way ant pheromone actually decays and so on, right? Mm -hmm. So, so it is. So, I think, uh, but the general principle that you know, using simple local interaction, one can find uh, collective patterns seems to be true. Uh, while the specific geometries and specific patterns and even the responses, uh, those will of course depend on uh, the details of the both mm. the sensory perception and what exactly they are doing with the sensory perception. Mm. Okay. So we have one last question from YouTube. Aditya is asking, what are your thoughts on applying these ideas to microbes? I think they have been applied. Uh, absolutely, yes. Yeah, they have been, you know, people yeah. have used these ideas in the context of um, um, a number of, uh, you know, uh, instances, all the way from collective migration in cells, for example, in wound healing, uh, or it could be in the context of uh, biofilm formation. You know, it's now mm -hmm. a mainstream research field. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like one last question from myself, like how will mathematical mathematical model will drastically change in case of a leader like in elephants, for example? That's a, that's a really fabulous question. In fact, uh, I have worked on, uh, you know, uh, how leader... Uh, can influence the overall properties of the collective and uh, and uh, and, uh, and how does that affect uh, uh, our modeling and I did not have time to explain them. So when the moment you mm -hmm. have leaders, there is heterogeneity in the group. So it okay. does become slightly more difficult to mathematically model the entire set of equations, which means not, not equation mm -hmm. forward by every individual is not same anymore, right? Leaders to something yeah. different than the rest of the group members mm -hmm. so it does become mathematically more uh, difficult uh, but it is possible to do some you know some analytical work despite them computationally you can you can it's always relatively easy to sort of put all these details uh, you know mm -hmm. in the computational models and then analyze them mm -hmm. yeah. like, uh, we can generalize that uh, if uh, more hierarchy is there in a society then more complex the model would be. more complex sorry then more complex the model would be Absolutely, yes, yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. So I think if there are no more questions, then I thank you, Dr. Gupta. Thank you talk. very much for the you know uh, invitation. And uh, I really enjoyed all the questions. Uh, and uh, again, the opportunity to talk to all of you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.